Now the core topics here in chapter 56 are the certainty of judgment and warnings thereof, the division of mankind into stations or degrees, a call to witness of that yet unseen by that which is seen, and man's right or obligation of choice, and also the unavoidable consequences of that choice. And not choosing is also a choice. So I shall go through the chapter and stop off and make comments as I go. In the name of God, the Almighty, the Merciful. When the inevitable befalls, and this is right, it is inevitable, whether we like it or we don't like it, death is inevitable, and judgment is inevitable according to the Quran, and this is a consistent motif throughout the Quran, uh, it calls us at all times to be aware of the day of judgment, this is something which moderns have been convinced is not applicable to them for some reason, but um, death has never gone out of fashion according to my observations anyway. To continue, there is no denying that it will come to pass. Abasing, exalting. It's interesting if we look around us today and especially in the electronic world of popular culture, those who are exalted and perhaps those who are abased. So things will be put right, they will be put into their proper perspective on the Day of Judgment. Uh, verse 4 to continue. When the earth is severely shaken and the mountains crumble away, then will they be scattered dust and you will be three kinds. So this temporal world which looks so permanent but which is entirely fragile as anybody who knows anybody who has died will understand, this temporal world in which we spend our time and chase after its supposed rewards, that's going away. At whatever time this happens, I don't know, and I don't believe anybody else does. And according to the Quran, uh, it happens suddenly, like that, in a twinkling of an eye. Uh, we are bombarded, especially today, with nonsense about privilege, etc. But ultimately, each man chooses for himself and wealth, worldly wealth, is not the arbiter of value or of, of opportunity. There is a verse, it happens to be from Revelations at the end of the Christian Bible, but it is pertinent. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. That's Revelations 22.11. This pertains to any time. If we look in the Quran, it says, do you think you're going to enter the garden just by saying we believe? No, this is not the case. We do undergo hardships, hunger, loss, loss of fruits, loss of money, lots of loss of lives. This is the reality. However, we have the promise of, of Jannah, of the garden. And men need to make a decision where they stand vis-a-vis -vis God's promises. Now, according to the Quran, there are three kinds. The companions of the right hand, this is verse 8. What of the companions of the right hand? And the companions of the left hand, what of the companions of the left hand? And the vanguard, this is verse 10. And now we have an exposition on the vanguard and what they may expect. The vanguard, those brought near. Now that's verse 11. Now that's a very interesting term, Quranically. In, in Arabic it's muqarrabun. And muqarrabun, it relates to, in Quranic parlance, those who are allowed into the inner circle of a sovereign ruler. This isn't a democracy. It's not a, um, a popularity contest. It's not open to everybody. It's open to those who put the efforts in. And what we're told, those brought near in the gardens of bliss, a multitude of the former peoples and a few of the latter. So, as an aside, I don't know when the end will be, but I do know that we're closer to it now than was the world at the time of the revelation of the Quran. 
clearly radical, in inverted commas, or uncompromising righteousness is on the decline. I don't think I'm going to shock anybody by telling you that. And we are living, more generally speaking, in a time of enhanced degradation and perversity. Whereas before, in previous centuries, there was a greater number of uncompromisingly righteous people within the society. And clearly that's not the case today. The general tendency is away from righteousness and purity and any form of objective virtue. As we see also in our modern society, it is being steered away from any sort of uh, appreciation of virtue and righteousness. And my personal understanding is, is that as we go forward, if this society continues in the way that it is, true believers, and I'm not talking here about quote-unquote Muslims, uh, I'm talking about true believers, people who, for whom God, God's standards, God's revealed laws are important, more important than a cushier life, those people are going to be increasingly marginalized and we're going to see something again of the type of sacrifices which have been made by former peoples. However, the amount of people who will do this, I infer, I infer from the Quran is not going to be very great. It's always been my understanding that I have been really addressing myself to the few and I understand that. So a few of the latter this is according to the Quran. I'm not making any predictions or prognostications about time because this would be a silly occupation. However, I'm looking at tendencies. To continue, on couches inlaid with precious stones, reclining upon them, facing one another, youths made eternal move about among them with bowls and pitchers and a cup from a running spring wherefrom they have no headache nor are they intoxicated, and fruit of their choosing, and such flesh of fowl as they desire. So, of course, this is a, a figurative passage, and there isn't an awful lot that I can say about it, because it is figurative. We are told that there is a difference between the figurative and the literal. If we look, for example, at uh, 3.7, we should understand that there is muhkamat and there's mutashabihat. And this is mutashabihat. There's no question about it. This is a figurative semblance. And for me to try to infer specifics on this basis would be really pointless. So I'm not going to do that. To continue. And pure, lustrous-eyed maidens, as it were, pearls closely guarded as reward for what they did. Now I emphasize the word what they did. There seems to be, and this is a quite a prevalent tendency and the inability to distinguish between opinions and deeds faith without works is dead being alone <laughs> to cite the bible it's completely correct so it's what we did and i exhort anyone listening to this to be clear in your mind about the difference between what you think you know your opinion what you like what you click on and what you do because I don't see anywhere in the book of God that we're going to get any reward for the opinions that we had and the opinions of others that we liked. It's, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm telling you how I operate my life. I want a high reward. And I advise everybody who wishes to make the best investment of their life to go for the best reward. But it is to do with deeds. There's no question about it. So... As they say in Yorkshire, think on, lad. Now, the pure, lustrous-eyed maidens, on a pantextual basis, this interpretation, it stands up, despite what some may think. So the traditionalist is correct, but not for the reasons that he gives. And if you wish to read a detailed and nuanced analysis of this very point, then I will put a link or provide a link in the drop-down below. So we are rewarded by what God knows that we want. What the realities are behind these um, promises, I'm not even going to speculate on particularly, because I don't think that it's really my place. I know that God is the best of providers, and he is the best of hosts 
and I can relate to the things that I read here and correlate them with what I already know. And on the basis of what I've seen so far, I'm prepared to trust God for the for, for what he's got planned. To continue, verse 25. They hear therein neither vain speech nor falsity. Now I'm going to stop here for a second. For me personally, uh, this is one of the greatest promises of the garden. I think that anybody with any sort of spiritual sensitivity is in a constant battle against lies, fundamentally. And lying has become de rigueur now, uh, very much so. I'm not saying that people didn't lie formally, of course they did, but it's now become almost the default position of so many people that you now tend to have to assume it, which wasn't so much the case before. It's an old-fashioned word, but honour is gone to a huge extent. Now, it for me, I have to work at not letting that blind me to the fact that there are good and decent people out there, and there most certainly are. However, there is such a preponderance of falsity, lies, uh, for myself, I'm not interested in any of it. I'm concentrating all of my efforts on what is true, rather than trying to fight on a platform with those who are operate in the realm of lies because there isn't any point but the preponderance of vain speech and falsity it's vexatious to the spirit and for me personally when I get up early in the morning and listen just listen to a, a robin singing outside the window it's a peace and a joy that it's hard to equal in the rest of the day with the cacophony of vanity which we have around us and which has become really the currency of communication now especially where so many people are veiled from any real communication uh, because they're doing it all online for myself my interest is in forming a community of a real community i don't want to spend the rest of my life doing this i'm putting these things online and when i've finished a certain amount of work i'm going to move on to the next thing god willing but to go back to this verse, the vain speech and falsity or the lack thereof in the garden is something which I personally hold out great hope for and look forward to. To continue, only the saying, peace, peace. Now, we'll understand this particular word and its significance when we get to chapter 97, because the object of this entire section, starting from Surah or chapter 50 through to the end of the Quran, it's what I call al-sujud. It is the submission. It's a call to people to make their determinations about God. And I'm using this word determinations advisedly as will become apparent when we progress further through the sequence. And this particular Surah, as all the Surahs that we've looked at so far, are really warnings and admonishments and invitations to embrace not Islam, not a religion, but to submit to God. As I've mentioned before, I think we know if we have submitted to God. And it is God who guides or does not guide. It is not up to a religion to guide you. There is a freedom to choose. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. No one can stop you being righteous. If you choose it, if you choose it and you stick to it, and you will be tested, believe me, but if you stick to it, nobody can stop you. There is an investment bank <laughs> that will never go bust, that is not run by a group of crooks that, that are going to run off with your money. It's not made off and co. This is God's investment. And this is what God is calling us to. This is actually what Jesus was calling us to if we would read the words of Jesus without the interpolations of later um, creative theologies. He preached the kingdom of God. And he talked always about the kingdom of God is like a man gone on a far journey, or the kingdom of God is like this or like that, or the, the parable of the talents. It's always about investment, about using what you have, and about a man being able to choose righteousness and to lay up treasures in heaven this is the actual gospel it's been 
obviously turned into something nonsensical by those who proclaim their belief in Jesus, but that is actually what he was talking about. This is what the Quran talks about. It's calling us to choose. And none of us knows, none of us, n n I don't know, I assume you don't know, how long you have to live. So I personally believe that it's worth thinking along these lines and um, choosing wherein lies your greatest good. So that's the vanguard, according to the Quran. We're now at verse 27. This is the second delineation or segment or degree. And the companions of the right hand. What of the companions of the right hand? Among thornless lote trees and acacia piled up in layers and shade extended and water poured forth and plenteous fruit unfailing and unceasing and carpets raised high. We have brought them into being anew and made them virgins, pure of speech, well matched for the companions of the right hand, a multitude of the former peoples and a multitude of the latter. Now, this clearly denotes a second category of people in a wonderful place of bliss. I'm not going to talk about the specifics of it for the same reasons as I don't above. These are metaphors and th things about which I have no knowledge. To continue. 41. And the companions of the left hand. What of the companions of the left hand? In scorching heat and scalding liquid and a shadow of black smoke, neither cool nor noble. They were before that made opulent and persisted in the tremendous perjury, and said, When we are dead and are become dust and bones, will we be raised up, or our forefathers? So I'm going to stop there for a second. The tremendous perjury, this is the rejection of the fact of the resurrection, of the day of judgment. And again, in this society we've been trained or are being trained to believe that it doesn't matter what you believe it absolutely matters what you believe because from this everything else follows you'll find if you read the biographies or autobiographies of very quote-unquote successful people especially people who've been very successful in this world that at some point in their life they fundamentally rejected god and decided to live for themselves. I'm not saying this is the case in all cases, but I have noticed it in a number of books that I've read about particular people. They're being consistent. However, they've made a fundamental error and it is the tremendous perjury and it does matter. And it's not that we don't have evidence, as we'll see as we continue through the chapter. This isn't some, you know, you happen to miss a tuppenny stamp lying on the pavement somewhere and now you're damned. No, you are living in a world of evidence you yourself are evidence and by rejecting that as we shall see as we go through the chapter you've made a fundamental choice about your place because god is not unkind god does not want bad things for his for his creation but he gave us the choice we are moral creatures we can choose and the quran exhorts us to choose well but it doesn't force us so to, to continue, say thou, the former peoples and the latter will be gathered together at the appointed time on a day appointed. Then you, O oh you repudiators, you will eat of a tree of zakum and fill your bellies therewith and drink of a scalding liquid on top of that and drink as the thirst racked camel drinks. Now, I don't know if perhaps you have never seen a thirst racked camel drinking but I, I have I've traveled across Mongolia and seen a lot of camels and if you ever see a thirst racked camel drinking it's quite a sight because camels go for many many days as is famously known without drinking but when they finally get to water they really belt it down and uh, make a lot of noise about it too 56 this is their welcoming gift on the day of judgment we created you, oh, that you but gave credence. Have you considered that which you emit? This is 58. Now, this is an allusion to semen from which human life springs. Uh, as in, we read in the book of Genesis, God created that with 
the seed of which was within itself. So this, our seed is within ourselves. Did we create this? Of course we didn't. Did you create it or are we the creator? Verse 59. Now, man is busy at this present time trying to arrogate to himself the role of creator. And this is part of what the transhumanist movement is about. But this is not a creative process. It's a process of perversion. As we have with GMO food, man doesn't create anything. He simply twists and perverts that which God already made. At 22.73, we read that man could not even create a fly. Quote, O mankind, an example is presented, so pay heed to it. Those to whom you call besides God will never create a fly, though they gather together for it. And if the fly snatch something from them, they could not recover it from it. Weak are the seeker and the sought. They measure not God with the measured you him. God is strong, mighty. That's 22, 73 through 74. It reminds me of the verse, and the, the plan of the shaitan is weak. It is fundamentally weak. Look at all these rich and famous and the, the good and the great and the not so good and the not so great die. They're not immune. None of them. Not one. We read also at chapter 4, 119, and this is the shaitan speaking, and he says, And I will lead them astray, and I will arouse desires in them, and I will command them, and they will cut the ears of cattle, and I will command them, and they will change the creation of God. And whoso takes the shaitan for ally instead of God, he has suffered clear loss. Now I'd like to do a talk at some time about changing the creation of God. This is most certainly what they're busy doing. But there is no way out for them, according to the Quran, and I believe it. 59. Did you create it, or are we the creator? 60. We have decreed death between you, and we will not be outrun from changing your likenesses and creating you as what you know not. Now, another aside. Satan's attempts to corrupt man are a vain and evil parody of the true change which is due men at the end of time. 62. And you have known the former creation. So, yes, we have. And this is the evidence. This is the great evidence. Do you deny your own creation and that of everything around you? This is why we're culpable. We are able to look at this and to draw, to extrapolate conclusions. Oh, that you but took heed. Have you considered that which you cultivate? Is it you who cause it to grow, or are we the cause of growth? If we willed, we could make it chaff. Then would you cease not to regret. We are debt-laden, nay, we are deprived. So this is God citing the evidence of, that we daily encounter. We eat food, all of us. If it were not for God giving the, the increase, there would be no food. How many of us are truly grateful for what we eat? 68. Have you considered the water which you drink? Is it you who sent it down from the rain clouds, or are we the senders? If we willed, we could make it bitter. Oh, that you were but grateful. Everyone drinks water. God is calling to witness his creation, the, the creation that you and I and everybody else encounters. By virtue of what it is to be human, we all eat and we all drink. 71. Have you considered the fire which you light? Was it you who brought into being the tree thereof, or were we the creators? We made it a reminder. Now, just on the side here, the feminine singular object pronoun relates to fire. So we made it, i.e. fire, a reminder and a comfort for those lost and hungry in the wilderness. 74. So give thou glory with the name of thy Lord, the Tremendous. Now, at this point, there are two segments in this chapter which, in my opinion, really operate as the equivalent to the altar call in Christian experience. This exact phraseology occurs here at 5674, also at 5696, which is at the very end of this chapter, and also at 6952, and in substance in many other places. So this is as part of the sujud sequence 
it's calling men to make their make their decisions and it's going on to the the personal singular form so give thou glory with the name of thy lord the tremendous and now we have god's own statement for i swear by the orbits of the stars and that is a tremendous oath if you but knew it is a noble recitation in a decree closely guarded none touches it save those purified a successive revelation from the lord of all mankind now just a quick aside about those purified gross men lost in sin are unable to comprehend the quran and it's not about washing a particular amount of times but it's when you are purified in your soul when you when you are inclining toward the truth then you are able to understand it and it's nothing to do particularly with language i've had arabs tell me they simply don't understand the quran they native arabs they don't understand the quran and that's quranic because we're told that unless god guides you're not guided and either he expands your understanding to it or he doesn't to continue 81 is it this narration you take lightly and make rejection thereof your livelihood now in the case of the professional traditionalist religionist the answer here frankly regrettably is in the affirmative because that is how he makes his money um, is by denying rejecting what god has sent however there's a broader sense in which this is true as well when people reject this what do they have left they've got making money they've got creating some sort of prestige for themselves or chasing after it in this world well the quran calls us to make a wise decision and we read as we continue at 83 oh that when it reaches the throat ellipsis you did not look on to continue but you will at that time look on and we were nearer to it than you but you saw not so what this is saying is but when it i.e the soul it's a uh, feminine here nafs when it reaches the throat when your soul begins to leave and it reaches the throat if you could do something about it but you can't it's again it's citing the fact of death i'm not being depressing here i'm just talking about reality and we were nearer to it than you 85 but you saw not now this calls to my mind for example verses for example like where god says that he is closer to man than the jugular vein all things are written down god is closer to you than you are to yourself but you saw not 86 oh that if you be without obligation you but sent it back if you be truthful so that this is the challenge you stop yourself being subject to death if you're correct but that is not a correct assumption 88 then if he be of those brought near so what we're entering now is the conclusion of the whole matter as it were if he be of those brought near gladness and sweet smelling herbs and a garden of bliss so that's the first segment the first delineation the first degree based on how you choose 90 and if of the companions of the right hand peace is thine among the companions of the right hand verse 92 and if of the erring repudiators a welcoming gift of scalding liquid and burning in hell so that's what we've been through is now being summarized and then the chapter concludes verse 95 this is the truth of certainty 96 so give thou glory with the name of thy lord the tremendous again this particular motif repeats as we saw earlier at 56 74 so give thou glory with the name of thy lord the tremendous it's calling you to turn to god to give glory to god to give due recognition to god to understand that you will give account on the day of judgment and to choose where you want to be in eternity i encourage you to choose well